Okay. I've gone, so. Are we live? <laughs> oh, I hate that. Hi, oh, Jeopardy. <laughs> right. Um, I think we're live. Are we live? Excellent. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to uh, this evening's uh, version of the AgriLeader Circle. We're live from the Halton Farms Milk Shack, so thank you very much. Uh, we'll hear a bit more about that in a bit. But tonight we're going to be talking about uh, uh, representing and educating um, the and um, the the interest. Ah, gone blanks. <laughs> 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 The image and the of the industry. So what we've got is we're going to be talking about what does the group feel the general public uh, opinion is of the British ag industry. What are the expectations of the industry? And we want you as the audience to send put that in all of these guys' lives and put it in their feeds and tell us what you think. So what do you feel the general public's uh, opinion is? What are the expectations? Whose responsibility it is to promote the industry? Uh, what do we do as AHDB already, and what more would people like to do? So, so let's go around the group and see who we've got. Just to say, Tom Pemberton was supposed to join us, but unfortunately he couldn't make it. Uh, but we have got Becca. Hi guys, I'm Rebecca. I'm a uh, sheep and arable farmer, and we're based up here in Yorkshire. Hello everyone, I'm Lisa. I work at AHDB. And I do uh, a lot of the work for reputation in the media team. I'm Ollie Harrison, an arable farmer from about 45 minutes away from here. I will just say, though, for everyone, we're all streaming on different devices. But if you go to either my YouTube or the HDB's YouTube, you'll see it from a better camera over there where it fits everybody in. Cool. I'm Isaac, and I'll try and remember what I'm saying. I'm Karen Holton. And I'm from Holt Farms, and I'm a dairy farmer. Uh, and I'm Charlie Beatty. I'm a beef, sheep, and arable farmer from Warwickshire. Right. Let's get stuck in. So put in your comments. What do you think and the reputation of the industry is, and what we can do to promote and defend that, and to get it more so widely spread. So, as a group, how do you feel? What is currently the the reputation with the public? Do you think there's a problem actually? I think there's a growing problem. Sorry, I'm going to jump yeah. in there for us. Um, I think because people are thinking more about where their food comes from and that environmental impact they have because it's being promoted by our government and companies and everything like that to think about your carbon footprint and the choices you make. I think there is, you know, that there is a growing or a stronger opinion now of farmers and some places that's good. And but I think it's increasingly getting worse. I, 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 I'd say that the opinion, a bad opinion is growing of us and not, you know, not, yeah, I don't want to say it's all bad, but I think there is a stronger opinion overall. So, Rebecca, um, what do you think? I think it's a really interesting one and I don't disagree that there are some growing negative opinions. I think sometimes the negative voices are all minority voices and shout the loudest. One thing I would say though is actually, I think it's really interesting. Sometimes I'll go somewhere and obviously you'll be in our wellies or you're in your boots or you look a bit like you have been out working on a farm. It'll be really interesting because it becomes a talking point. Oh, are you into horses then? And I had it the other day, I went to pick up something from a shop in town. Oh, do you work with horses then? And I said, no, no, I'm a farmer. It started a massive conversation. And the first thing this man said to me was, oh, you must work hard then. I know you've been busy. And I thought, what a really positive comment. He thinks, you know, it was maybe just throwaway, but I felt really humbled. It made me feel like he was respecting the work that we're doing. And lots of us have busy jobs. But yeah, I was over the moon when he said that. And he understood the time of year was a busy time of year. Karen, you get a lot of people coming into the milk shack, getting their milk and their ice cream. What's your feeling when people come here? Well, I'm probably coming from more of a positive place um, because of the situation I'm in. So when I'm seeing people, I'm seeing the people that are coming to me for a reason to buy my produce. But the great thing is that I learned from that is they're choosing to do that because they're starting to understand about farming and what we've got to offer. And they, it's really important to a lot of people now that they buy local food and they can come here and see the animals. And what I'm finding more of is that that's important to them to be able to see the animals and how they're kept. And I think the, the way we struggle, I know we've got this pressure about what we produce and how we produce it, public goods, public money and all this sort of thing coming at us. But at the same time, if we can demonstrate that we're doing a really good job, then that's our stage and we need to do that. Brilliant. 
uh, you know, we like high jeopardy, so we've just had some people coming in to get some of your milk. So brilliant. So we can ask them as they come out. Please, are you? So I was just going to say that um, from an AHD perspective, we do a lot of research on the uh, public opinion of farm and farming. And actually, within the entire supply chain, uh, farms are the most trusted and always have been. Um, consumers are very uh, caring about what you do and very um, sort of appreciative. Um, and I would say that whilst the attention is being sort of being drawn to the environmental impact of our food and how it's produced and where it comes from, I think people are now in a different position where they can almost start to choose where their food comes from. It's not just about going to the supermarket anymore. You can come to places like this and actually see how your milk is produced. And I think people who are in those fortunate positions do want to do that. Um, and of course, it, for everything in the world now, because it's so open, the things like social media, the things like Google, there's just so much information out there. And I think if there's a remote slight bit of interest of where your food comes from and farming, they go to it. Yeah. Tell us, tell us in, on the comments what you think. Sorry. If we're the most trusted and we're being told that there's a high opinion of farmers, the most trusted in the supply chain, why are many farmers still struggling to break even, let alone make a profit? So for most consumers, they uh, don't want to think about how the food gets to the supermarket, i.e. the process of what you get paid or, or, or you know, to understand that it's a, you know, animals have looked after it and the environment is looked after. They want to just assume that that's taken care of and they don't have to think about that at their point of purchase. They want to think about what's convenient for them, what works for them and how much it costs. And that's the same for environmental impact and welfare. And that's probably where the disconnection is. I guess they don't feel they have the power for it. It was in the news recently that uh, milk has come down in price. Uh, so they cut retail prices of milk. And it's fascinating because whilst that appears to be a good score in the media, we sit here as uh, as people who understand what it is to produce milk. And you know, why are we cutting milk prices if they can remain where they are? Because that could then go to them to dairy farmers. Well, so, why also is milk cheaper than more? That's that sort of shelf life of what three years? Yeah. It's it's absolutely wrong. because they're a price maker. Yeah. So how do we how do we change that? How do we to, you know make that reconnect with with farmers? What's your thoughts on that? Oops, sorry, I'm. She's reading the camera. <laughs> well, a lot of it is that's about actually it's, it's used as a loss leader. Our product, isn't it? Our yeah. product. The problem is with milk is it's used to get people into the supermarkets. And if like there isn't a very well-known supermarket this week that's put out there that they've dropped their milk by 5p, but they've not dropped to the, the price to the farmer, which is an absolute lie because the milk price has dropped to the farmer and they've dropped it in the shop. But they're hoping, obviously, that they're going to get football. But how many people go, I'm not buying milk because I can't afford it? But how do we, as an industry, you know, both us as a, as a, a levy body, but also you as farmers, how do we change that? So consumers, because, you know, the reality is until the consumers start asking for that and, and being much clearer about it. So how do we make that connection stronger? I don't think the consumers think it's their responsibility. Like no, but if, if we can connect with them, do you think? You know, yeah, think? absolutely. Yeah. Like, that's telling our story. Like, yeah. We do we do beef and lamb boxes, so similarly to you with the milk shack. You know, I do get the positive sides of things when people come to us for our uh, produce but again they're you kind of almost preaching to the choir there yeah. because they're already converted it's it's maybe making those that haven't thought about it and, and generally I don't think have even considered that it might be their responsibility as as the end consumer to help change the way the balance is well what I find crazy is we have fur trade products in supermarkets <laughs> yeah. none of which are UK products yeah. you know wh where's the UK fur trade logo We've got the highest, some of the highest welfare standards in the world. And we need to be paid for those standards. Maybe we do actually accept, though, that consumers trust that we're doing the right things. We don't need to get them involved. They don't really have the time or the inclination to get involved. So we trust that that's happening. So let's say we've got a tick in the box for consumers want it. They know it's happening. We know we're doing it on farms. So maybe we need to look to the other people. Supermarkets are a massive, massive power in the supply chain. And basically, if sharking farmers left, right and centre, 
I've been to some talks and things where people have said, well, we all need to go back to buying local and, and whatever. And I simply come back and say, you can do that with meat boxes to some extent, with milk to some extent, but I can't go and sell even a kilo of wheat locally to, you know, to my, to my neighbours. And so we've got too much food to, to move for this idyllic, well, we'll all just sell to our villages. It needs to be illegal for supermarkets to buy things below the cost of production because that's what they're doing at the moment with eggs. They've got egg contracts that are below the cost of production buying the eggs because they've got the supply to them. But, but ultimately, it's you know, the, the customers always write that saying. So, how do we as farmers connect with the consumer so that they do? Start changing. How does that? You know, we've had all we're doing tonight. The thing for us is we do lots of school tours. So we have the cubs, the scouts, the beavers, and um, in the evenings come round. And um, we have schools. We have WIs. We have. We just if we can get those people on farm. We're doing Open Farm Sunday on the twenty fifth of June. So if we can actually get those people here, the people from in the towns locally who are going to come here because it's a free day out. And they think they're going to go on a farm and pet some calves, but once they're here, we've then got to sell them that message. We do the same with WI, and I always find that the WI and the scouts, the scouts and the cubs, massive one. The WI, that's you know, they're coming out on a free trip out, and it is it is such an easy way to kind of show them what we're doing and hit maybe a target audience that we wouldn't necessarily hit. We really yeah. get strongly agree with that. And for us as well. Sorry, Charlie, it's, right. it's getting them to taste the product. The product do taste. So much better. Oh, absolutely and different. Yeah, and it's it's also they get here then, and we'll give the product away to get them to taste it. And once they taste it, they're like, oh my god, there's nothing like the milk in the yeah. supermarket. It's such a low size bed. But I think I completely agree about educating and connecting people to what actually goes on on farms and not hiding it behind smoke and mirrors. But ultimately, when they get into the supermarket or wherever they buy their food from, a lot of people will see that it's British. Some of them. Um, trust that, but they'll still go for the cheapest possible versions that they can. And we're here as farmers saying we need more, we need more money for our product. Therefore, the food price needs to go up. We've then got consumers saying we can't pay any more to food. So we're we're always going to hit a barrier. Because I'm as stands. guilty as anyone as that. You go do the food yes. shop. Yeah, I, I make sure it's British, but. I still go for the best value for money. And we are in a cost of living crisis as well. Like, how can we expect our consumers to fork out when some of them can barely afford to pay the rent or heat the houses? So, so which is the first one? Does that uh, go back to the supermarket thing? We shouldn't allow them. Oh, absolutely. To have really poorly made British products that are loads cheaper. But then we have a government with a head in the sand and a deaf minister who's saying, no, there's absolutely not a market problem with eggs. So, and they want cheap food to get both. Yeah. Well, how do we how do we change? So you know, so they, they, we can sit here and and talk play. to the cows. Go <laughs> to the cows. Go <laughs> boom boom. Coming in for milk, <laughs> <it>, shortly. <laughs> <laughs> but how you know what can we do? Because you know, obviously, it's a lot of you do a lot of really good stuff. But and how do we get more? And and Lisa's point about farmers being the most trusted. How do we get more farmers involved? And how do we get that message out wider? Well, as part of the well, we advanced we campaign of bread. We did a lot of consumers. Just tell us a bit more about what is weed balance. Uh, so it's a campaign that HPV runs that promotes uh, red meat and dairy as part of a healthy balance diet. This kind of uh, solid view or single-minded view that you could just eliminate it, and there you go, you've got a healthy, uh, eco-friendly diet. And it's it's not quite so simple, you know. They, 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 it does have a really important role. So we have this campaign, and as part of that, we really understand what messaging consumers would respond well to. Uh, a lot of the focus group came back and said, you know, we're really appreciative of farmers, but we never hear from them. We don't know what they do. And I think in some areas that you are very available to them, but in other areas, you're really not. I mean, I'm not from a farming background at all. And if I wasn't working at HDV and doing what I do, I would never, ever, hear from you or see what you do and have that experience. I only do it because of my job. And that's the vast majority of the population. Yeah, so, so we had a, a thing here on Ollie's YouTube saying, Mike English, I'm a non-farmer. My concern for farmers is the cost of fuel and fertilizer and the increased labor costs. How much is that an issue? And I guess, and kind of what can I do to help with that? 
it's a massive issue. The, the thing, the only thing that's missed up there is interest as well. Interest mm -hmm. rates are not very good on my farm at the moment. We, I've I've invested to push forwards, thinking there's going to be brighter days, and now interest rates have gone up. It's just so. What, what can we say to Mike? Yeah, what you know, what can he do to to help far, support farmers? I don't even know what the answer is there. Is it our own for not having to shop at a supermarket? Yeah. Or some, some supermarkets are better than others. So we have a look at I think I think we do need a fair trade fair trade UK brand. And then people can look for it, can't they? Is it something red tractor should be doing? I think one thing that's important to note as well is that farmers are price takers on the whole so by doing something like this so you can see uh, milk behind us and um, you can basically set your own price whereas the majority of farmers are not setting their own price so if you can afford to find somebody who's setting their own price with meat or lamb boxes selling eggs locally you know something direct find price makers and support them if you can afford to do it i'd say and can i just say on it? everyone on the pricing as well, we've been doing this since 2016, 2015, 2016, and nobody has ever complained about the price. Nobody's ever come in here and said, oh, milk, a bit, I can get it cheaper at the supermarket. That's not the point of it, is it? This is like an auto cue, this phone, but honey, it's the hot, <laughs> it's the bat phone. So uh, Berkshire Farm Wheel has just said, in America, farmers are well thought of and respected. The people in America understand the importance of how, how, how do we do that here? Yeah, how do we do that? I think that, that's a good comment, but I don't totally agree with it. I think it's the farmers that we see and the people that we see on social media that are related to farmers think that. But I think you probably find lots of America are so disconnected from agriculture that it probably is yeah. the same thing. Yeah, I was thinking, like, I've, I've spent quite a bit of time in Australia and New Zealand, and particularly in New Zealand, I was out there not long ago, and it's, there's so much, like, the distance between your general public and a farmer is so much closer. Like, oh. out here, you could go into the city and nobody knows it's related to, has a friend of, that is a farmer, whereas in New Zealand, a smaller population, everything like that, but... So everyone knows someone that knows a farmer, yeah. and that's, I think that's a big part. I suppose it. probably it's a geographical thing. So probably eighty percent of America feel like they know a farmer or what goes on on a farm, but eighty percent of the people that live in America don't live in them or they all live in the city. So it's probably like twenty percent actually feel like that, but we only know the eighty yeah. percent of the population. Yeah. That makes sense. Twenty percent. Oh. Uh, yeah, yeah, ninety nine percent statistics are made. No, you know what I mean. Like you can travel across America and the, all of geographical locations and all the different towns, and they'll be surrounded by acres and acres of farmland. But in reality, there's a thousand people live in that town. When you get to New York, and how many million people live there? But so, like AHDB are doing these campaigns, like Week Balance and Love Land Week and all that. But and the dairy one. And yeah, yeah, ab stations. absolutely. So what, like, but you know, uh, what, what more do we want as farmers to see? from them coming i want people to comment and also if you're general public like what do you see of what ahdb do and what makes a difference to you because and actually those are marketing campaigns which is not strictly reputation yes you are promoting a a a product you're not promoting an industry you're not protecting an industry it, it's it's a slightly different um sort of area of work so i do work with we but it's not what i do i work to promote and protect your life see i would so, just say that those campaigns are yeah. all so that's industry marketing. protection it's like yeah it's we your, we, your kind of your name is tech we had uh, i think it was uh alejandro blair somebody with ahcb need to be much more proactive in responding to bad science on the subject that's one comment and where was the one from from um oh, Alejandro Blair, is the ASVB's job to promote farming to the consumer or to be investigating, researching, improving farming for the levy payers? Arguably, they go hand in hand. Take it out. Well, when we did the Shape for the Future vote um, last year, the year before, where we asked the industry, what do you want us to focus on? What are your priorities? And it was overwhelmingly this sort of um, reputational aspect where you want us to promote you, to protect you, to run marketing campaigns, to push education. 
the sort of technical element that um, um, Ali refers to there is kind of further down. It's kind of like leave us to do the farming, go out and, and give us a good name. I think that's a really good point though, because as farmers, we like, all right, the ones that have do social media are, are all right at it, but we're not, mar we've got, not got marketing degrees. We're not good at marketing our own produce because as a rule, we generally don't have to do it. So I'd say we're probably not very good at marketing our industry as well. You know, that exceptions to the rule, but as a whole, I would say that the industry isn't good at marketing itself. So, and I, and if Lisa, so you'll you'll come in on this, but we balanced this uh, department for scrumptious affairs. All of those things were much more targeted at you know the demographic that are waverers or you know as, as farmers, you might not necessarily see those campaigns because we put them on two uh you know since stations and in the metro and things like that so so that is very targeted campaigns yeah so the, uh, the we advance campaign is targeted at waverers or people who are unsure about whether to do meat and dairy in their diet or they're thinking about reducing uh, and it's just to kind of hit home those messages as it does you, you don't need to eliminate it there doesn't need to be that blanket approach um keep it in your diet it has a really important role both environmentally and uh, for health and um, human health um and it does work i mean the the, the results that come back to show us that those people who are exposed to it who may have had those sort of doubtful um thoughts go well actually yeah i'll, I'll stick with my uh, beef uh spag bowl tonight instead of my corn uh, and it's just it's just tapping into those seeds of doubt um a massive thing for me with it all with the AHDB as well. I want you to be fighting the misinformation because you know when I'm awake at three in the morning and my head's spinning and I've got all these fantastic ideas of what I'm going to do today on social media and I'm going to go out and I'm going to do this and I'm going to you know solve all these problems. You know by the time I hit the car pens at four thirty and I've got a set of twins and three cows of carved, you know, and then the day goes on by eight o'clock at night, I'm just like I haven't got that inspiration anymore. <laughs> So, and then also there's so many things that when we go back on social media and start to kind of correct things, it's like in the back of your mind, you're always like, oh no, is that really true? Oh, oh no. And you it's almost really want somebody to say, yeah, you're okay. You can say that. You're okay. okay. So I was just going to say, we do have an email called the ad check. So ad, ad, check at ahdb.org.uk. And you can pretty much throw anything into that email and say, is this right? It might be something that you've seen. It might be something that you think might be right and you want to talk about it in a school and we'll check it and we'll come back and see and tell you but if it's right. Presumably not just farmers can email that. Yeah. Any, if they think anyone. that sounds dodgy, like anyone. the Flora thing at the moment. It's yeah. On some really so, dubious data. We, we've had lots of comments here on Charlie's Instagram about some of that. So, yeah, there's but, obviously... But we a, need your eyes and ears because each other is exposed to this because of how algorithms work on social and what you're exposed to. Tell us what you see. We'll take a look at it and see what we can challenge. Give us a couple of examples of what we've done. So um, we challenge a lot for misinformation, particularly for um, adverts. And remember, it's only paid adverts. If it hasn't been paid for, we can't challenge it. It's not under ASA uh, jurisdiction. Uh, we may have got a lot of complaints. A lot of them aren't upheld by the ASA. Uh, ASA rules around environment are changing very rapidly. Uh, so we're learning um, as that's happening. But some of the big ones that we've uh, managed to um, successfully contest is Meatless Farm, um, Oatly. Um, there are some big, big ones we've been able to um, argue against. And so what, what you're saying is just actually not correct. So if a, if they've paid to promote a tweet or paid to promote someone on social media, you can challenge it. Yeah. But if they haven't paid, you can't. So it's our job, isn't it? Right. It's yeah. Isn't that really hard? Like I generally try not to make a point of arguing because we were chatting about this earlier and it if you start arguing it doesn't get us anywhere you know and I I try to ignore comments like that but sometimes there'll be like the odd one and you'll think well you know I know I can present a good argument against that but I want to make sure that my facts are 100 1000 percent correct before I argue and they pick and fault in it and then I I'm on my own and, and that's something that we struggle with because we you know so that, because of the organization we have to be so science-based yeah. so so it is a tricky thing but you know Lisa yeah I think there's also a really I think your points on actually mustering up the energy to post on social media is a massive point I've got to go back this evening after this and start editing a video I know Ollie's been trying to squeeze one in we'll try and get an Instagram post out 
it's really, really draining. And I think people think, well, it's just a photo. There's way more to it. And actually there should be way more to it because we are under scrutiny. That when it, you're following this building, everything has to be exactly right. But I think one thing as farmers we do have to do is make sure the stuff that we're posting, yes, it's factually correct, but it's understandable and knowing your audience because we can say stuff on our Instagram because we're just doing a job really quickly. Oh, I'm just doing this, blah, blah, X, Y, Z. Well, somebody watching who hasn't been on a farm, it, it speaks as though it's in complete riddles and they don't understand it. So actually, to some extent, if we're trying to connect with the public, that story or that post was a waste of time. And I completely agree that you try and word posts and stories and whatever, and, it, and it's a tiring thing to do. And no wonder not every farmer is going to have the time or information. But, but just to being encouraged on that. So we had Mike English who said earlier, he's not a farmer. For me, the best marketing tool for farming has been Ollie Blogs, and I thought Ollie to get to, you know, something <laughs> there. But yes, it does show that the things that all of you do, and, you know, wherever you are out there, and the things that you do and put on social media, it does help educate people and people are interested in it. So Putting a personal face to anything is always so impactful. So what you, you said earlier, Charlie, I don't think I'm very good at marketing for myself or my industry, and I would absolutely but, disagree. But, but I'd say yeah. it's one of the most powerful things we can do as individuals. Um, I, I think I, with that, I'm more meant like agriculture, like farmers in general, not necessarily general. the ones that of us that do put the time and effort into, into social media and whatnot, I guess, because, but, but I, I, I definitely find the success of anything that I put on social media is always um way higher if it's something more personal if, mm. if you put a face to it and a yeah, person it, to that i noticed that very early on the tiktok you could put like whatever was trending on and it did the flop or fail it's it's fly or flop but everything i put on with my face in explaining something was consistently really good yeah so that's so tiktok people think <laughs> it's for kids it's better than explaining something but, show but no one wants to hear the noise behind the camera <laughs> like yeah. these cameras are pointing at us, they're not pointing that way. They want to feel like someone's talking to them. Yeah, yeah. They want to, you know, they want to you'll go listen to the radio. Yeah, we'll talk yeah, about yeah. some putting good stories out there, you know, good personal stories. Just tell your story. And a rant's really good. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> you've got the facts right and a good rant. And put a bit of comedy yeah. in there as well. <laughs> the rants go down well. Well, like. That's how Ollie's got famous. <laughs> it's ranting like, on Twitter. A thousand percent better. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I've got the hat then. <laughs> yeah, but then I get really worried if I ran because you say things in the heat of the moment and then you're like, oh, that was I yeah, you know, always think it's sound like a stuck record. Yeah, but don't forget, forget you, you can edit it. So if you have some, you can take it out. Okay. Yeah. So, so it's not a live run then? No, no. Uh, yeah, right. We get rats in now. <laughs> <if you want. laughs> Come on, that's a controlled run. It's a controlled run. But, uh, uh, but you've uh, got the passion then. If you, yeah. if you if it's a rant about something that you're not happy with or you think something should change, then you get the, the passion. And that's I think that's something that as farmers we don't always under we don't realise just how genuine we come across when we're passionate. And I know loads of times I've spoke to people or people come here and I speak to them or I go and speak at something and people say they can see, and I'm just talking, I think, but they can see how passionate I am. And I think as farmers, that's what we are, because to do what we do and get up when we get our, up and work in the weather as we work, we've got to have passion, haven't we, to yeah, do it? Get up, it's, it's that balance between ranting and moaning, though. Yeah. Like, yeah. I think there's, yeah. there's got to be... It's a bit of a, to do your job and take £10 for a bottle of milk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would. <laughs> but, so, so we had uh, David Modram here saying, so we need, um, and I'm not going to mention him again, because otherwise, uh, but we need Clarkson and you guys to lobby government. So, you know, so how... How do we get that voices and your all of your voices and, and you know the people said so on the other side so how to get those voices more heard in government in you know whatever bodies so and local authorities yeah. more heard how, maybe how we, we take that? the same approach to protesting as france and denmark and that. no well so <laughs> We've nothing to the make. world's changed a lot in the last <laughs> sort of five years even more so in the last 10. if something if something's topical and you can get it to trend on social media the MPs listen to that then, and the newsreels talk on it. The, the print, the papers print it, and the MPs need to listen because you've got the voters watching you. I was going to say, strike up a relationship with your local MP. I think that makes it. But nothing difference. strikes a local sort of better than the knowing that people are following you. A local celebrity. No, I don't mean that. <laughs> I just mean it, it, to them, it's all about that they, they want votes, don't they, yeah. when there's an election? And if they've got someone that people are listening to, with, so if they call it influential, then they want to be your mate. So MPs want to come out to farms, 
Yeah. But also maybe it's something you should do with, with local journalists is strike up that conversation. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. If you're available, you know, they're always after stories. So how do you know then do a bit more of that, whether it's local or you know, wherever we can get that in with public facing media. Yeah, but, but it's so photogenic farming. They, they always want to, to be out, you know, an office. You're going to talk about your place again. <laughs> I mean, um, I've got it. Now. <laughs> <laughs> you did feel the pressure early when you saw all the girls. Um, I think, well, on a policy landscape, there's a lot happening for uh, agriculture, uh, and that, uh, there'll be a lot coming for uh, you know, home uh, consumers that will impact you the industry. So there will be consultations. They're, they happen in the time. They're open for you to respond to. So when when they talk about you know environmental labelling. Go on there, put your views on it. I think another point, like you, you know, like you said, there's a lot of changing in policy and everything like that. And a lot of farmers will think that actually maybe reputation isn't my biggest worry because there is so much uncertainty with those policy changes that, and that's something that they'll understand more and feel like they've got more of maybe not necessarily more of a say in, but yeah, like just yeah, a better understanding of and actually maybe reputation to them is less important to things like that and that uncertainty. So I've probably done it a bit more personally now, whereas I've started doing things like I'm on the council for the World Association of British Dairy Farmers. Um, so I've been invited soon to the House of Lords to go and take a take about labour shortages. Yeah. So it's things like that as well we can do and influence. And, you know, I do, I do a little bit stuff with DEFRA, sit on a farmer advisory board. So there is other ways as well. You know, it's individuals away a little bit from social media. We can do, and that's important here because that one thing leads to the next, leads to the next. Yeah, so it's important for them. It, it is very disheartening though when we feel like, right, maybe we're making an impact in social media. Consumers are on board. We're getting to some level of organization, kind of policy makers or whatever, being on board. And then we get to government. And I do feel like we are massively hitting a brick wall with that. But that's not strictly like AHDB's area as such is it so ahdb is non-departmental public body which is a lot of jargon which basically means we're sponsored by defra and how we operate is all set out in law we are publicly funded by yourselves and your levy so our role is to ensure that the government is informed on all scientific databases for when they're making decisions about things so we quite often go into government and we sit and we give evidence so that they can make informed decisions uh, when they're putting policy in place. We, we can't uh, lobby, which means we can't sort of push for change in legislation. We just have to demonstrate the evidence for perhaps why it could be changed or, uh, or shouldn't be changed. It's the job of the NSU. The NSU are the lobbying organisation. They're the ones that bash on the door and say, this is what you need to do. Um, so no, we're not lobbyists. So that how way. closely are you able to work with the NFU to kind of? So we have a really push those relationship so that they are fully informed by what the evidence is, and perhaps some of these uh, influential sort of factors at play, so that they can go in as fully informed as, as we are. But they're obviously able to say things that we can go yeah. to and criticise government. We can't because I think anymore. that's a massive misunderstanding from a lot of farmers mm -hmm. is what AHDB are and aren't allowed to do and what's the job of AHDB or what's the job of so other we, levy so other lobbying bodies. So we're politically neutral. We're not on any side of any government. We, whatever says goes at policy wise. So, yeah. I think some a big part of that is to be stay reputable as a as an organization. You know, you need to provide the facts. You need to provide the science. So, you know, we we play with it and, and we we try and push the boundaries as much. But so we need to you know, be science based. So that's we we provide the ammunition and, and somebody else's job to find the bullets is kind of the yeah. the way of yeah. of saying that. Um, we had a really good. This is Rebecca's Instagram from Darvel Paul. Uh, back on the previous point, it's the personalization, uh, enabling the public to actually see who's producing their goods and showing that you are real people, great job folks. So, yeah, you know, nice. Uh, you can see supermarkets doing that though, because a lot of their um, their advertising is just massive pictures with an actual real life farmer and not a model farmer who's just been roped in. They are wearing the work clothes they wear every day and, and they are authentic, which it, it just, help or i hope it helps so yeah if i think they are doing it yeah, yeah. <laughs> stroking yeah <laughs> another one here it's from suji um on my youtube i think she'd never heard of ahdb before watching my videos 
I don't know. So can you, if you, if you, if you still sure watching Sue, can you tell us? Are you a farmer or are you just a YouTube watcher? And, and for the fact, we'd be interested to know what you actually do. Yeah. But so if anyone's watching the live, can we? Can, can you tell us who's farming and who's not? Yeah. Yeah. See the thing for a lot of farmers as well. There'll be farmers out there who think because we pay a levy, we pay AHGB this money. Surely it's up to them to go out and lobby on our behalf or change things for us because we're paying you. So it's good if we can clear that up. Like it's not why we're paying. Yeah. yeah. So, so, oh, I was just going to say there's loads of AHDB resources as well, which you wouldn't know unless we go looking for them. And we've had that discussion before yeah, we started. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'll say it on other screens as well. Mm. There are a lot of resources which I just don't think we're aware of. And so when you start to utilize them, go to some of the conferences, forums. I really need a forum as a prime example. If you go to some of those events, your levy starts to make a bit more sense. And it's not, I went to actually an interesting talk, and I'm not selling the HDB here. But, um, <laughs> yeah, I'll put back again next time. I'll be back. Um, the, the chap who was talking said, you probably all view your AHDB levy as a tax. And by the end of it, a lot of people were seeing, actually, well, maybe it is more of an investment. And I thought he portrayed it really well. Uh, maybe what well, export markets, for example, the AHDB helps open up. Therefore, that's potentially improving our price or markets for offer, which obviously isn't a big thing over here. And I think once you start to delve into organisations like the AHDB, it becomes a lot more obvious. Yeah, it's, it's a bit like, we moan at the public don't understand where the food come from, but equally there's farmers out there that don't understand where the AHDB levy goes. There's a lot of farmers who don't realise they pay a levy. There's a lot of farmers. <laughs> <laughs> they don't know what that is on the bottom of the lamp. Oh, it's it's been been known. Known. <laughs> and that's because of the way it's collected. I mean, we don't know who most of our levy payers are because we just get the money from a lot of the time the processing from the abattoirs so at the end. Um, cereals, it's slightly different, uh, but that's what a big challenge was for shape the future we wanted all these people to come and vote and and put their priorities forward but there was no way of us writing to you and saying to you hey you know you pay this levy come and tell us what you want to spend it on so if you're listening so That's make sure you get in contact make sure you get yeah then if you're listening get in contact make sure you get levy you know some of these guys are talking about so just a quick one with the shape the future um survey then what did you guys think of how it was laid out and how it was as a survey because I found it quite inaccessible not inaccessible but quite like it was very heavy I'm just going to kick off I didn't even know it was a thing didn't do it yeah didn't didn't get involved I think so you know we we fully accept it was our first time we could have done it better with anything that you do for a first time so you know they'll they will take some lessons away from it so um but it is. We we need to hear these things. We need to hear yeah. your, your voices. Challenge us. And tell us what we can do yeah, better. Um, it was more. It was more how kind of how heavy, like heavy it was, because you kind of got so far into answering it, and then I think a lot of people would have got set a certain distance and just been like, oh, I can't, I cannot so quite stomach this. It's it really wordy. Yeah, it just needs to be like yes or no, or like there were a lot of scale things and voting and that kind of thing, but it was really wordy, and I think a lot would have just looked and gone, yeah, no, I've got better things to do with my time. Just getting back to so no, we'll we'll take that on board and, and take it back. So I think I did a really good dissertation <laughs> a long a long time ago. <laughs> well, we had a really good uh, question here on Rebecca's Instagram from Jack Samson Blacksmith. Great name, Jack. Uh, good evening. Can balanced diets and nutrition be a tool that is better taught by tackling obesity and poor nutrition? Uh, be tackling by showing farm to plate process and where good food comes from. I. I don't know if I'm getting the tone of the question right, but I do think we have a massive disconnect of how to cook food and how to make, for example, cuts of meat go a long way. Um, people think that the butcher's expensive. Well, it is expensive if you go in there once a year for, your, for a treat and you buy your turkey at Christmas for the, from the butchers because obviously it's a one-off, it's, it's a big deal. But go into your butchers, have a conversation with the butcher, find out what a cheaper cut of meat is at that time because it does fluctuate. And ask the butcher for advice on how to cook it. And I guarantee it'll go further than you think. Um, we live off leftovers. And we can, our food bill is actually quite a, a low-cost food bill. I'd say we eat relatively quite a lot of food in our household, as a lot of farming households do. Just drinks a lot as well. <laughs> Here, Ollie. I love that. <laughs> but I, I definitely think there's a disconnect. Food, well, there wouldn't have been food technology back in the day. Home economics, 
pretty much verging on compulsory back in the day. Um, and so I think, yeah, we do need to reskill children when they're coming up in, in basics of cooking. And we're saying, uh, later on the year, I think in the September one, we'll look at them, you know, going into a classroom, talking to teachers and, and you know, support the circle. So watch out for, for that one. Um, but I, I do think, I think a lot of we were talking about it earlier, people are more interested in where their food come from. And I think there is a niche for this and healthy, fresh cooked food. If there are people going back to that, that, that is something we can, can tap into and, and promote as an industry. Well, people want quickness, don't they? They want speed, they get in from work, they're tired. But the amount of TikTok accounts I see, and I must have gotten some food algorithm, um, of quick, easy, five, five minute, half an hour, 20 minute dinners, you can use British produce for those, whether you're vegetarian, vegan, meat eating every single meal, that produce can be British, local, in season, and you can still get a quick dinner from it. It it doesn't have to be a ready meal. It doesn't have to be processed. Yeah. It doesn't have to be imported. You can do it all. Um, it's changing the mindset, isn't it? It's We've got it, and it's almost like we're coming full circle now. I think so, yeah. It's something, I know, it's a, we've talked about it before, and it's a massive bugbear of mine, like you say, that food production and... Um, it, and that isn't compulsory in curriculum because it's not like it's not a luxury it's a necessity and it blows my mind that it's not compulsory to learn about but what's AHDB's ability to kind of sway that and you know if you're working with DEFRA and the government and and push that um, the inclusion of that more in schools and education because I think that's really important that's where we start with children so I will I'll only touch on it really loosely because we're doing the education um, event in September but we are our official partners with the British Nutrition Foundation uh, and we run the Food Facts of Life education program which is a completely free resource that goes into every level of school so right from year um, age four to uh, 18 and it uh, teaches nutrition, food preparation skills, menu planning, cooking skills. And uh, since we've come uh, on board, which was about four or five years ago, I think, we have expanded that now into environmental impact of food health, um, and sort of the, the health of nature. So we do do it, um, and we've got a really good partner. To what's, what's the uptake of it? Like? It's huge. I mean, particularly for um, during COVID and home learning, uh, the uptake on resources and free downloads was absolutely massive. So is that for people to do at home or is it school-based? No, it's it's just all educators. Uh, but because of COVID and home learning, it's sort of everyone went on the internet and went, I need free resources. And I see I've never even heard of it again. Yeah, it's another uh, one. So, so uh, just at the start of the year, we did four um, education events, Scotland, Wales, England and Ireland. And there were teachers in the room and we got real farmers. Uh, they they stood on the stage and they said, "Our oh, farmer, this is what I do." And the uh, reaction and the feedback from the farmer uh, teachers was phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. It was amazing to uh, listen to a farmer and understand what they do. I can take that back to my ch uh, kids in school because, like you say, because they're not connected to farmers themselves, it's really difficult for them to teach it because they don't have that personal experience. Um, so yeah, we, we do do it. And a few, I can't remember how many hundred, it was hundreds of, of teachers at these, these four hundreds, different conferences. Yeah. And, yeah. and so we train them, thousands online we train uh, in, in just this information so they can go back and look at what they've got. So you need to publicise this more, you need to promote yeah. yourselves we better. Need to know. Like, like, we, you do do this. I don't no, you really don't know about to this. And that, right. that would make me feel so much more positively about HDB knowing that you, you guys are doing that. So a couple of people Hopefully. have replied to different Instagram accounts uh, to say that they're not farmers and be just interested in learning where the food comes from. What's this one? So James McDermott said, what about the counter argument for providing the customer what food types they want? Helping educate farmers to produce processed products that the consumer are used to. James is one of my best mates from uni. And yeah, but that's James. Okay, if anyone is watching, if you watch it on the AHDB or mine, it's it's off that camera, not the phones. Yeah. So, what, what's your counter argument to James? Can you reread the question? So, <laughs> Charlie's. <laughs> so James is basically saying, so do we as as farmers have a, a job of providing more what people want rather than saying we produce this, you could you got to buy it at a better price? No, because we know what we're good at. So we we know what we're good at producing. We know what we're 
it depends what you're if you're on more about a marketing front then yes but if you're on about more about physically what we make and what we produce we'll know because we all know what and that the process, you, know, you, you, you do give us the data of what's needed and what's not like i remember being at an age you were thinking you were like oh you know demand for barley is going up at the moment you know so yeah. that i know that's i grow commodities but you know yeah surely Simple. the people lamb will know what puts of lamb people are wanting i know you can't <laughs> that's grow legs Taylor. of lamb <laughs> so something else that we do well, is that you could prefer it to people and sell it in the box so what I was going to say is when we, uh, so when you ask people what what do you look for when you buy something, they quite often say, yeah, I look British. I want to buy British and high welfare and environmentally friendly. And then when they get to the till, they go, oh, actually, I'm going to buy that thing because it's cheapest. And they've shown that um, British to buy British versus the cheapest, no matter where it's from, there's about a 10% margin. That's about as much as they're willing to pay for, the, like the additional yeah. to buy British. Uh, and I think it's really difficult because whilst you want consumers to support you, a lot of people are in a situation where they literally buy what they can afford or what, and what, what they're for comfortable them. with, maybe if it's cuts of meat. Yeah, so I always I think, think that one thing, sorry, we do it with our meat boxes, we use the recipe cards yeah. and everything like that. And I think that's a really good way to promote those lesser used that's cards. Is, is that the midweek meals? Yeah, 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 we use all of them. I've got, yeah. I've got so many of them in that's boxes the at beef, home. Sorry, but it beef. makes people. They, they look at that picture and go, oh, actually, that looks pretty good. And it's it's a, a basic enough recipe that, oh, maybe I'll have a go at doing that. And I think that's a really, really good way of doing it. It's is a leading reason why people don't buy beef and lamb. They don't know what to do. Yeah, them. not surprised. It's not because of things they read in the press or they make it a little bit too expensive. They look at these cuts that need a little bit more attention and a little bit more cooking ability and they go, I don't know, I'll go for chicken, I'll go for yeah. So midweek meals, the recipe cars. Get it on there. We always get so many comments on the recipe cards and the meat boxes. What you're talking about the price of things and the 10%, you've got to question though, how has someone been able to produce something miles away and put it on the shelf? What are they skimping on? And that's that's the other reason, like you know, you should think about that. So Foster, thanks uh, for broadcasting, Karen and Tom. Uh, really thought provoking. Uh, is it being recorded? Yes, it'll be on the AHDB. YouTube, so you can go and find it there, and share it, you know, and tell everybody, tell all, all of your friends. So, you know, then Boston. Yeah, yeah, yeah I do. Thank you. Excellent. <laughs> right. Um, what have we missed? We that, on the big screen, <laughs> that is the next thing, is it on the big screen? Um, what have we got? So, back to whose responsibility it is. So, you know, some, a lot of you know farmers want us as as the levy body to pay uh, to to you know promote it, but who else? So we talked a bit about it. If you send you know as a farmer, if you've been as what who where does that responsibility lie, or where does that balance lie? Well, we definitely have responsibility. We have to take responsibility to make sure that if somebody walked onto your farm because they got lost, or if they're following a the footpath, or if they are actually coming from nosy to try and catch you out, we have a responsibility to make sure that everything is absolutely to the letter of the regulation and I would actually say probably better a lot of people are doing it better so let's be proud of that and let's be open about that and and even simple things like lot on lots of farms just like humans some animals some humans are being treated they might be on antibiotics they might look lame they might look poorly well if you've got a poorly pen maybe have a whiteboard and you know x y and z treatments so if somebody does find themselves in the in their shed thinking oh, that pen looks absolutely awful because you've got two lame sheep in there. Well, actually, you can see that they've had uh, this jab on vet's advice, vet called X, Y, and Z days. And then we're really accountable. We can be accountable, but all our records are inside on some scrap of paper or on a laptop. Let's make them, you know, you don't need to tell them the letter of that had 0.2 yeah. mil of whatever yeah. at this point, but let's make it so if somebody stumbles onto, onto our farms, it's really obvious that we're doing all the right things. We can take responsibility. So you get a lot of fixed for the war. Yeah. yeah. So the maternity ward and things like that. So you've done a lot of that, Karen. So tell yeah, us we do that. loads of that. And I think people, if you can explain to people what you're doing and why you're doing it, that's what they want to know. So we have a um, thing there like Isaac says called the maternity unit. So when a cow is calved, she will go into that unit. And anybody, as you can see here now, coming up here, they can see the calf pen, they can see the cows, they can see the maternity. But then again, now and again, there'll be a sick cow in there. 
So there might be a cow who's under the weather, who's got E. coli, but she'll be in there, she'll be being treated, there'll be some water with her, there'll be food with her. People will come up to there and say, oh, what's going on with this cow? When you start to have that conversation, they'll be like, oh, right, so um, that's a bit like me when I've had a baby. And, you know, we'll start to open that conversation. The other thing is as well is lame cows is a big thing in our industry. Um, but I always say to people, you know, if you look, if you sat in the traffic centre and watched a thousand people go by, how many percent of those people are going to be lame? Well, I'll, I'll tell you, there's a far lesser percentage on my farm of lame cows. But again, we need to talk about that. You know, we had a cow with shackles on a while ago and uh, she'd carved and her ligaments had gone a bit weak. So we put some shackles on her and a lady was at the gate with her children. And she actually rang me the next day and said, oh, we were really upset. We saw this cow and she got these chains. And, you know, when I started to tell her why, and if I hadn't have put them on, she would have slipped and done the splits. And then, you know, you have to put them down. And she was like, oh, wow. Oh, my God, thank you so much. That's fantastic. I've learned something. This is where the polarisation is happening because uh, vegan activists take pictures or videos of things like that and put them on social media. They attach all these emotive words. They make it really humanised. And people go, oh, my oh, God, oh, it's hideous. But then that's because no one understands the context. They do, um, I, I've seen so many times front page news articles about it. Things and, and people come to me and you know, Lisa, what is this all about? And when I explain to them, they go, oh, right. So how do you pay? Which is so important to us as to why we have people coming in so we can talk about it. We've got to open up that conversation and chat about it. So how do we find that balance between, you know, somebody's put up there, uh, what you don't want is end up in this endless spat and you know, name calling and it needs to be a positive argument. So how do we as an industry tell the good stories like you do here, but when we have something like that? So how do we push back but not end up in a, in a name calling argument? So the very nature of PR is to give yourself a good name, a good reputation. And any good PR practice is you focus on your positives. You don't worry about anything else. And I think sometimes the farming industry gets a bit focused on everybody else and they don't just think about well, what are we doing? What is epic about us? And that's what they want to hear about. Consumers tell us all the time when we do the research, we want to hear about what you do. We don't want to hear about you bashing other people or getting upset about what they say about you. It's like you said, it's leave that to the politicians. <laughs> no, talk about what you do. That's good and that's amazing. And, and that room for improvement, like you said, when you when you explain to people, it may not be perfect, but that improvement, people are, yeah, okay, you've got it, it's fine. Sam, I think that sounds like Ryan. quite a lot like Again, it's fine for us that we're all actively doing the social media stuff. And well, it sounds like quite a lot of work for just your general Joe Blogs farmer to think, well, I'm doing my job and I'm doing it a great job of it. But now I have to explain to the Joe public why I'm doing every single thing, like putting shackles on or, and et cetera, et cetera. And it, it sounds like, a, like, a, like I know a lot of people will watch this and go, well, you know, no, I haven't got time. I'm, I'm a one man band, but I haven't got time to do that. So, like, but how, I think it's every single time. You, you don't turn? have to spend the hours you know and editing videos or whatever but it's every little opportunity you know you yeah. have to take a little bit of time but it's just having that mindset change of you know when i have somebody on the farm on a food farm or whatever i can spend that two three five minutes yeah. having that chat rather you know it doesn't happen and i think that's that is a, a mindset change that we need in the industry yeah completely yeah. agree I, I was going to say i think that's just as important because we're sitting here from this oh yeah well it's all right for you because you have followers on instagram or youtube yeah. or you have been able to invest in this amazing thing and you are able to have people on the farm and i say people will be sitting at home thinking i can't do that that's not right. um, but it's even as simple as if you go into a village shop or into the pub or the time that you speak to somebody on the phone who is a friend and they're not farming because it all multiplies they'll go and tell their friend oh yeah but i was actually speaking to this farmer and you know that thing we use well he said it doesn't even happen on his farm and they're like we need to be as positive with people as we can because they'll tell our story for us as well like people can help us we, we just need to not alienate them breaking that stereotype of a farmer being a old boy with a shotgun over his yeah. His shoulder going get off my land and <laughs> yeah making us more approachable i guess long questions on the horse too <laughs> Which one do you want? The retractor one. Where's it gone? There uh, was. Uh, it, it does roll on. There's a question about. Um, so from Adrian Hutchins. Um, they Ollie promotes the retractor, but um, doesn't feel it's pushed enough. 
in in big stores um, you know what's your thoughts on the red tractor can they do more so how do we make that a much more powerful brand they did do a tv advert didn't they last they've year got, they've got one running at the moment actually I, the, the problem with red tractor is is they don't want to split store other than yeah. farmers that it's costing them money yeah um what where are we on the legislation of flags because we weren't allowed to put our own flag on while we're in the eu were we? yeah yeah, so the red the red tractor logo has the flag within it. But, but, to yeah, yeah. Demonstrate that it's from the UK. Um, but but I must point out, if you look, the New Zealand flag includes the <laughs> Union Jack and then some stars. So when you look at something, you can think, oh, it's got a Union oh, Jack on it. Yeah. Yeah, so no, the red tractor really it's more of not very ugly. So and it's it. hidden by the actual tractor. tractor. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. It doesn't have that connotation for consumers who, again, but, they're in a rush, they sprint in. But if they can put a trailer on the back with a full of flat, <laughs> maybe that would work. So I, do, do do that? <laughs> I think it does just need to be a bigger logo. Because you a lot of people don't even see them, don't know what it means, don't even actually see it on the food packaging. It's one of the most just recognized logos. So logos are really contentious issue for consumers uh there are a lot of logos out there and most people don't have a clue what they mean they don't understand what they represent red tractor is the, i think the number one recognized that's from their own research though because <laughs> i've seen that presentation <laughs> no no that sounds viable um and i I've, 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 I've done a lot of these type of events for exports where we have importers come on live and we talk about what what british um sort of uh, produce offers them and the whole red tractor scheme is one of the greatest selling points of British produce because it's it's um it's uh it's world leading. You know, there's no there's no other uh, scheme like that in the world that sort of that covers the entire. That is only good if we are exporting, though, isn't it? Otherwise, it's it's shackling us with undue expense. We're working on it. So if you if you're watching this, uh, we there's a bit of a watch this space, but. Hopefully, the July is in circle. We're going to be talking about exports, and uh, hopefully, send a couple of you guys might be able to shadow an inbound um, uh, send coming in, send you know importers, exporters from from that side. So watch this space. Not confirmed yet, but you know. So we'll talk about some exports in in uh, one of these in the future. So uh, well, some queued up there. We're getting towards the end. So any final thoughts from from you guys? So you know, some. How do we how do we defend and how do we you know, um, build the reputation with with Joe Public? Positivity. We've got to be positive. What we what you know what we do. We've got to be passionate. We've got to talk to people. We've got to have conversations. We kind of got to take opportunities. So for us, if we have opportunities to have people here and have conversations, then we take them every time. I think for the good of the industry, but for our own good as well, is that positivity? Yeah. Exactly. And I'm going to echo that kind of, obviously we're doing things maybe a bit more public facing and we want to keep doing that. But even if you're not doing something public facing, but you still comment something negative on my Instagram, don't bother. Let's all support <laughs> farmers because if people see farmers attacking farmers, we've got absolutely no hope with the public. So even if it's something that you disagree with that you think they're doing on the farm, why don't you just send them a message, talk about it, ask them why they do it. Have they got a different soil type? Have they got different shed space, different labour availability? And have a conversation, learn, and tell people that you've got negative comment on another farmer's social media. It's just not worth it. Which really is an interesting here on Alton Farms Instagram from Bigfield Baby saying, really interesting conversation. Thank you very much, everybody. Often find our best PR come from when we're crossing the cows over the road. People love to ask questions, and this is a great time to engage. So, brilliant. I think, yeah. quickly, positivity wise, as a farmer, one of the most rewarding things that we ever do is having the WI or the Cubs slash Scouts out on farm into yeah. the lambing shed. It moves, does wonders. Okay. That. You, you do know, though, bad news travels faster than good news. So, if you do need to get a message out, if you can cling it to some bad news, <laughs> no, it all seriously, like, right. the education that we did around spraying off footpaths because we said, But what's damaging our crops? If we'd have just gone, Oh, just can we please stick to the footpaths, no one would have yeah. Yeah, got to, you've got to have something within it that's either controversial or or bad, really. To spark a reaction and yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but you can, but I think it's it, balancing it, 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 yeah, it's, it's, it's not, not so bad. bad. Like you were joking before about rants, but there's passion in there, and it's generally about something that's bad in the world, whether it's the price of milk or the price of eggs. But if you can tell the story within that, 
that's that's what gets you you're, the reach. You're right, because if I email a journalist and go, look, we've got this great farm to talk about this, and then, yeah, whatever, and then something happens in the news, and go, look, now I've got this great farm <laughs> to talk about this, they go, oh, okay, then yeah, we'll bring it. Yeah, that's, that's exactly it. Uh, so in a minute, we'll just go around and remind everybody some of your social media accounts and all of that. But I think we've got some ice cream coming in. No. <laughs> well, <laughs> we've, we've, got, got, we've got a glass of milk. A glass Because of milk. when we do things around here, we always toast the cows and toast the industry. <laughs> well, I might be doing well. <laughs> yeah, so there we go. <sighs> Ladies. Yeah, thank you. There we you. go. Is it warm? Oh, really yeah, so spot on. Are you going to Can you just introduce that by man, please? Top time round. Uh, this is um, my husband, Tom. Um, well, he's actually I'm the good looking one. Yeah, he's actually known as Karen Holton's husband. <laughs> Tom, hi, he's Tom Holton. <laughs> there he is. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers to the cows. If anyone has Cheers. missed, any of this, it's available on the AHDB YouTube, uh, yeah. beyond mine as well. So, thanks there. So, let's okay. go around. We'll we'll start on that end. Rebecca, tell us who you are, your, your socials, and all of that. Uh, Rebecca Wilson 722 on Instagram. You can see I didn't set it up to actually get followers. Um, and Becca Farms on YouTube. That's just started. Uh, Lisa Bray HDB. If you want to send anything to us, just uh, send to add check at ahdb.org.uk. Uh, I'm Agri Contract on most platforms, but if you put in Ollie Blogs, that'll find it. And in about 10 minutes, we're going to go and have a look at the milking the cows with it milking from. And you'll see that in tomorrow video as well. Excellent. So send look at Ollie on that. Uh, I'm Agri Isaac uh, on Instagram and all those things, but um, obviously the AHDB YouTube channel, uh, AHDB Beef and Lamb on Instagram and on Twitter and all of those. So follow us there. Tell us what you think. Uh, tell us what you want to hear more about so on, on our YouTube thing tonight and we can try and work it in the future. And subscribe to the AHDB channel because we're nearly a thousand subscribers. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm Karen Holton. You can find me on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Um, where else am I? Tinder. TikTok. <laughs> yeah, Tinder. Tom. Oh, no. It's actually, it's actually some grinder. Yeah. <laughs> Come on. Yeah, YouTube. We've got a YouTube channel coming. And if you just look, basically just look for Holton Farms or Holton Farms Milk Shack, you'll find me. Um, and I'm Charlie. I'm on Instagram and YouTube, but I'm pretty rubbish on that. Um, and as that's as Charlie Farms or on Facebook as Meriden Farm. Excellent. Thank you very much, everybody, for watching, putting your some questions in, telling us all about us and what you do and what we can do better. So thank you very much. And we'll see you next month. Cheers, cheers to the cows. Cheers. 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 Cheers.